Good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. Uh, a little bit about myself. I have been uh, born and raised in this region. Um, it's now 33 years at SEPTA. Uh, I've been general manager for seven years, and prior to that, uh, I was the chief financial officer. I am a CPA. I think the, we had some accountants over there. Um, but uh, now I'll talk a bit, little bit about the uh, SEPTA, what you might not know. How do I advance this? Eric? We're the sixth largest system in the United States, cover a population of about 4 million uh, people. That hasn't changed in the last uh, 30, 40 years, but what you have had is sprawl and people moving out of the city into the suburban areas. Uh, Dal daily ridership we have to update is 1.165 uh, million trips each and every day, and we have about uh, 9,400 employees. I go right back to finance. Like I say, I am a CPA. Uh, operating budget is $1.3 billion. 70%, um, 71% of that is labor and fringe benefits. Uh, we're very in labor intensive in industry. Um, another 19% is materials and services. That includes paratransit uh, operators running the paratransit services for us. Uh, so that's 90% of our budget. The remaining is propulsion, fuel, injury and damage, interest, expense, et cetera. Number of employees, 80% are represented. The big, big uh, union that we deal with is the TWU. Uh, we believe in pattern bargaining. They set the table for the other unions, and then we have 17 unions that we have to deal with. So they set the pattern, and then we, uh, they roll it out to the other unions. Some of the other unions like it, some of them don't. Uh, but that's just the way it is. But the TW contract is important to us, and it's also important to the region. Uh, we don't have binding arbitration, and the only leverage that the union have is to walk out. Uh, it's unfortunate, and, but they utilize that as, as much as they do. Uh, but if you look at over the years, and I've been involved in labor negotiations uh, since the 90s, um, in the past, they used to uh, have a contract, used to be two-year contracts. So every two years, you have to negotiate a contract. The 90s, we tried to get a three-year contract, which su succeeded. In the early uh, 2004, we got a four-year contract. In 2008, we got a five-year contract, which, you know, to me, it brings stability within this region. Um, unfortunately, the last round, we were unable to reach a, a longer-term deal. So we have a two-year, seven-month contract that expires November 2016. One of the reasons we were unable to get it was two big issues. One is the affordable health care uh, issue that was on our table because our costs are going up. Uh, there's all these requirements for uh, kids up to age 26, et cetera, really driving up the cost. And at the end, in 2018, we were looking at uh, facing the so-called Cadillac tax. So the cost goes up. You know, if the cost was above a certain level, you know, they tax the employer, and we were facing that. So that was an issue we wanted to address. The union's perspective, they wanted to deal with their pension issue. And everyone said, well, who's doing the pension? And we have a, a defined benefit plan. But what we have is, and what we always have, we have a salary cap. So only a certain amount of dollars of your earnings go into the pension uh, formula. That cap has an increase in 2001. In 2001, it wasn't an issue because their base salary for 40 hours was below the cap. Now it's above the cap, and it's an issue. So that'll be a major stumbling block that as we go forward. Um, as anyone knows, the pension is a big issue. Uh, the cost of to go retroactive to use prior service is very expensive. So that's something we're working on now in preparation for the next round of negotiations to get something that's uh, um, that we think the union will, will buy at the same time is affordable to us. Uh, other uh, strategies, and I'm glad to see that we have a lot of attorneys here. I'm glad most of them are not personal injury attorneys. Um, uh, we made a concerted effort a number of years to put cameras on all our vehicles. Uh, right now, 71% of our, or the fleet is, is equipped, and as new vehicles come in, they'll, they'll also be equipped. Uh, one thing that uh, has been, the results of this has been significant, and these are payouts. And again, IND is uh, a small percentage, but you're still talking about 
in uh, 2012, 43 million dollars we were paying out in injury and damage. And what you have to realize is when we go to the court settlement claim they're injured, we didn't have any proof. The operator was no incident, and they go, I'm hurt. They go to the doctor, he's hurt. I don't know if it happened there, it happened at home, happened playing basketball or whatever. Um, and we'd be on the hook. With the cameras, we can actually, it's a witness for us. And we can actually, this is what happened, we have the video, that person wasn't on the bus, or yeah, they were on the bus, but they barely moved. So we're not playing. You can see the result of that. Uh, went down from 43 to 32 to 30, and we're projecting it down to $27 million. 36% uh, reduction when it was from 2012. Significant. One of the things it also has, and I'll mention this, 85% um, of the fees that, that are available to the uh, uh, police department in the city of Philadelphia comes through SEPTA. And these cameras have been instrumental in serving a, l a number of uh, cases, uh, murder cases. Uh, there was a, a kidnapping that happened uh, right outside uh, in 69th Street. But I'll, I'll talk about the murder case. They had uh, an individual, uh, well, you know, a deceased person, but they had a, a red, red sweatshirt at the scene. That's all they had. So they approached us, can you look for something? We have nothing. So we looked at hours and hours of tape finally identified an individual with a red sweatshirt. Continue viewing it, 20 minutes later, the person got back on the bus without the red sweatshirt. They were able to identify and make an apprehension. So that's the value of, uh, you know, what we have on the system. Uh, sustainability, uh, we're doing a lot as far as uh, paying for some of the capital upgrades. One of the big projects is a CHP project, taking Pennsylvania gas, uh, to create electricity that, that will provide the electricity for half our regional rail. At the same time, provide uh, uh, a facility, uh, reduce our facility energy costs at one of our major facilities. Uh, we also have a number of ESCO projects where actually we, uh, we're, we're, we have companies come in, invest, put the latest technology in, reduce our energy uh, cost, and use that, those savings to fund the improvements at the, uh, at the facility. Uh, revenues, uh, we have passenger revenue, that's obviously the majority of our revenues. Uh, we have a policy that we'll do uh, fare increases every uh, three years to mirror inflation. And uh, I've been involved with this for a number of years, and I remember having hearings where you have thousands of people protest. Since we institute this po policy, you know, we have a handful of people show up at our hearings. Those people expect it, and as long as the increases are reasonable, uh, they accept those uh, increases. Uh, but the other thing that we've been very, <coughs> uh, had great success is, is pushing the other uh, elements of income, specifically the naming rights. AT&T Station, uh, Jefferson Station, uh, two of the biggest naming rights in, in, in transit in, in the uh, country. Uh, the other thing is we have uh, extensive uh, advertising domination at Suburban Station, and there's another one in the works really uh, increases the, uh, the other income element and uh, relieves some of the pressure on the, uh, um, the fare increases. Uh, the last one I mentioned is energy storage, because this is, I was talking in London a couple years ago, talking about this project. And uh, actually, I had two other speakers actually talk about the SEPTA project. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a huge battery. Uh, I think the battery is like 12 by 15 feet, the room. Yeah. Um, but actually, it recaptures uh, breaking energy that's normally lost in the system, recaptures that, stores it in the battery. Sometimes we use it on the system, other times we sell it back on the grid. If it goes up to a certain price, uh, they sell it back on the grid and actually uh, creates revenue for us. We have uh, one project that actually is in the works and we have two other substations that we will be rolling that out. But people are all over, not only the, the country, in the world looking at this project and looking to replicate it. I mentioned the operating budget. This is a capital budget. Uh, capital budget, until we received Act 89, was about $300 million. Um, most of it, some of it was with Act 26. Uh, this is statewide, so it's not just SEPTA. Uh, in 1991, we had uh, Act 26. It was a lot of new taxes, um, PERTA tax, et cetera. Uh, they were expected to generate $200 million of revenue. Uh, 15 years later, it never hit that mark. So it was 
uh, started at $2 million, was supposed to grow to $300 million, and it never materialized, primarily because it was new taxes or the tax had no increase, um, inflationary increase. Act 44 was 2007, another instrumental uh, uh, proposal. Uh, part of the problem with that is it was all predicated on the tolling of I-80, uh, which the Fed turns down that application, so that funding source went down. So instead of 200 million growing to 300 million, it actually went down to 100 million dollars. So 2010 to 2013, there was a lot of discussion about another transportation bill. In, 2000, in September 2013, I testified at the Senate Transportation Committee hearing, and uh, I was asked to present what would happen without a transportation uh, package, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, on the left is our regional rail and transit map, fixed route map, 2000, and this is what would happen. It wasn't going to happen overnight, but over 10 years, this is what the system would be, uh, due to a number of reasons. Number one is we have facilities, we have bridges, specifically on the media line. That was the first to go. There's four major viaducts. Happens to be my line, major viaducts that was would probably uh, be shut down because of safety reasons. The other thing is uh, vehicles. We have these uh, suburban and the trolley routes. Th those vehicles are 33 years old now. They will not last another 10 years. And the other is the, uh, the Silverliner uh, 4, which is the bulk of our regional rail fleet. Uh, they, were, they were put in service in uh, 1974. Uh, they're already 40 years old. They would not sustain another 10 years. So basically, we didn't have the capital money to reinvest in those, uh, those vehicles. So therefore, you saw a shrinking, a shrinking of the system. Of course, the, uh, the Broad Street and the Market Frankfurt line would still exist, as well as what we could serve with the Silverliner 5 cars that we had in service. So to get Act 89, we had a broad-based coalition, uh, transit agencies, highway folks, uh, highway builders, uh, the ports, uh, chambers of Commerce, uh, all supporting, and elected officials all supporting for a transportation bill. Because as bad as the transit was, the highways were just just as bad shape. And some of the reports came out of the Economy League, because we had a lot of groups in Middle Cent or Upper Pennsylvania that they'll do a highway bill, they didn't want to do a transit bill. And, and the elected officials, and this came out of the report from the Economy Leagues, 40% of the economy came out of this region. 32% and 5% of the land mass. But yet, even with transportation, we're only getting about 26% of the transportation dollars feeding back. So we are actually a giver to the Commonwealth. Uh, the other is SEPTA in and of itself is $3 billion economic input um, to the Commonwealth, 26,000 jobs, and 62 and a half million in tax revenues. We also had a map of all the businesses that we do business within the Commonwealth, and we actually showed it. So you had um, elected officials in certain areas that weren't, weren't even aware that we did business to, uh, to a, a company that was in their backyard. The other thing is, and I, I mentioned this, uh, mentioned our budget was about 300 million. And one of the things they came up with, and uh, well, we already know it, you look at comparable size transit agencies, Boston, New Jersey Transit, uh, WMATA, it's a little bit bigger. But basically, they had a capital budget of a billion or more. So we were at a third, and you talk about years and years of that underfunding, it's going to catch up to you, and it did catch up to us. And it's still, even at a billion dollars, it's catching up to some of the other cities. The other impact is what transit means to, uh, to real estate. The average impact of almost 8,000 per house, and in these high impact areas, you talk about uh, real estate value of 31 to 37,000 per home, just by being around the, uh, the transit station. Very fortunate in 2013, I'll mention uh, Senator Rafferty, we really took the, the lead on this, and we were able to, uh, to get Act 89 passed in the law. So what this does, again, it basically doubled our, uh, our capital program. But the important thing is that Act 89, unlocked, unlike Act 80, uh, 26, it's predictable, it's bondable, and it's growing its inflation index. So, you know, we don't think we'll have a financial crisis in the next uh, 
eight to ten years. And what we what we will do with this money, I mentioned to Harris earlier. A lot of it will be visible, but a lot of it's behind the scenes. People don't, people don't realize we have we have we're responsible for 350 bridges within the region. Average age over 80 years. I remember years ago I was talking to Al Beeler with Secretary of Transportation. He invited me down to D.C. to talk at the Ashto conference, and he was talking about his 50-year-old bridges. I said, this will be easy, because I was talking about my 100-year-old bridges. 121 of them are over 100 years old, and some of them are significant. This one, uh, right outside of Norristown, where the school was built in 1990, uh, 1911. We did work a couple years ago to, to fix the, fax, uh, the, uh, the track bed, but did nothing for the infrastructure. It spans 3,200 feet. We need to address that. We also have a number of these stone arch bridges. You can see the crumbling of the infrastructure here. That, that specific one was built in 1902. Uh, addition to bridge, I can go on and on with bridges. But this is substations. We have a similar problem with the power substations. This is Jenkintown. Uh, substation was built in 1931. Um, that was built by the Reading Railroad, and they did it different than they did than Penn Central did. If this fails, I have, we have no parts, so we can't even go to Amtrak to see if there's any parts. If this fails, this will shut down all those lines powered by this substation. Generally, a substation lasts about 50 years. Uh, this was 1931, so we're well past uh, the useful life. One positive thing, this is what we're addressing. We need to address, look at the ridership on regional rail. 50% increase in the last 16 years. We're carrying more people than we ever did. We need to address it. And the number thing, we need to put more seats out there. We need, to uh, talked earlier, we need to increase parking. Um, and we have to improve the station. So this is our first go at that. I can't do it. EMU is going to take years and years to get that. So what we're trying to do is get new, new locomotives. Um, also look at uh, bi-level coaches, which uh, we put more seats out there. And uh, within the next couple of years, you'll see those uh, things on the system uh, for immediate capacity relief. We're also rehabbing all the coaches that we have, uh, the internal coaches. That will be done in the next two years. Uh, and after that, we'll be looking at the Silverliner uh, 6 purchase to replace those ones put back in, uh, put in service in 1974. Uh, buses, uh, we made a decision to go hybrid buses. Obviously, it's, uh, it's cheaper on fuel. Uh, by the end of this year, or 2000, over half our fleet will be hybrid. Uh, we're introducing these buses. I'm sure you've seen them on the street. They're being delivered now. Uh, we, we expanded it. We had 155. We replaced it with 185. Uh, actually, to put more seats out there. We only have one driver. Trolleys, uh, we'll be proceeding to this. This is more uh, four or five year horizon. Uh, replace these trolleys. Again, they're 33 years old. They're not accessible, so they have to be accessible according to ADA. Um, and again, these are what the trolleys look like. This is what we're looking at. Uh, obviously, we have an issue with the tunnels as it goes in the 40th Street and the, the, the curves and everything else, but that's something that we're looking at right now. Uh, stations, upgrades, uh, this is what we'll be doing uh, throughout the region on the, the regional rail. Uh, that'll be the stations, and we'll also look at the high-level platforms so people can get on and off the uh, trains quicker. And these are Exton and Katsahawken are on the drawing board. Uh, people mentioned about parking lot. We need to increase the spaces. Uh, look in comparison, Boston has 43,000 spaces. Metro Chicago has 90,000. We have 25. And on a daily basis, we're 90% uh, we're full, if, if not more, at some of the locations. So we're doing parking expansion. I mean, whenever there's space is available around the station, you know, I send my real estate to see if we can buy it. Uh, this is at Lansdowne. We're doing a parking garage that would increase the uh, number of spaces, three, 400 at that location. We're also looking at uh, transit-oriented development around our stations. Uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, housing and business so people can live there, get on the train and go where they need to be, or people arrive at the train and go to work. Uh, three developments, Spring Mill, Ivy Ridge, and Conshohocken on the Norristown line. Uh, this is one of the successes we had at Temple University with uh, mixed-use development right next to our station here. Uh, we did a lot of work 
on the street level with uh, uh, bike racks and improving the entrance. Uh, next we'll be uh, doing the platform level improvements. And septic key, uh, people have been asking me about this for a while. Uh, it's currently being tested. Uh, we have a lot of the equipment already installed. Uh, basically, it'll be a smart card system. If you have a chip in your card on the credit card, you'll be able to tap it, use the system. If you have an Easy Pass, you'll be able to link that into your Easy Pass account, use our system. If you have a phone app, hit your phone, you can use our system. We'll still have the weekly cards, still have the monthly cards. Uh, the good thing about that, if you currently use weekly or monthly, if you lose a card and you register, we can cancel that card, give you a new card, and so you have some type of protection. So uh, more to come on that. In the meantime, I still have my uh, SEPTA tokens in the emergency. Um, uh, that will be rolling out this year. And people said, now they got the money, when can we do with the expansion? And uh, there's a lot of expansion projects ext extending the Broad Street line to the Navy Yard. Uh, this is the one that really has some legs on the Norristown line, ex uh, put an a extension into to serve King of Prussia area. Uh, the reason it makes sense to us is we have a lot of vehicles going to King of Prussia from downtown, it's stuck in the traffic on the Schuylkill, it's stuck on the Blue Route, uh, just like every other traffic. So if I can make that almost a seamless travel, it, uh, it'll save us money from a bus perspective, but it'll, I think it'll attract more people. Again, this is a planning stage. Uh, bottom line is we still need federal dollars to make that happen because you're talking about hundreds of uh, millions of dollars to make that extension work. Uh, Dilworth Plaza, Paul Levy did a great job designing this. Uh, we did some work here with our entrances and some of the uh, uh, elevators and escalators to uh, serve that. Uh, but we really have to do City Hall Station. I mean, that's something that's sorely neglected. It should be the centerpiece of uh, this transit system. And no one wanted to attack it. Number one is the price tag was too too high. Number two is they didn't feel like bringing down City Hall, didn't be re responsible for that. Uh, but that's, that is in the drawing uh, works and we'll be doing it in the phases. But in the next couple of years, you'll see a total renovation of that station. And city center city concourses. Uh, who owns them? The city of Philadelphia owns it, but we took over responsibility for them um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, the reason we took over because people thought they were ours anyway. <laughs> I mean, really, they, I mean, they had a little story, I'll tell you. About two years ago, I was on the weekend, I get a call from the mayor, Mayor Nutter. And he said, hey, Joe. I said, hey, Mayor, how are you? What can I help you with? He said, uh, I got a little problem. I said, what's that? He said, the escalator at 15th Street. I think it's right here. He says, it's been, it's been out of service for two, three months. When's it going to be fixed? And I said, tell you the truth, Mayor, I don't know, but if you want, I'll call public uh, property to find out what their schedule is. <laughs> so his silence on the other end. He goes, you mean we own it? Yes, you own it. <laughs> but people don't realize that. People assume that we, you know, and it was, uh, and it's our passengers using it. But I did tell him, I said, you fix it, you get the contract to fix it, we'll take over the maintenance for it. Because uh, we do have uh, an excellent uh, elevator, escalator, and maintenance. As a matter of fact, we're, we're actually maintaining the ones for PACO for them. Um, this will be coming. So we plan on, after we do, when we do City Hall, it'll be done in phases. You'll see a whole new concourse, and I think this is going to, uh, you know, turn around the whole concept of downtown Philadelphia, improving those, con uh, improving those concourses. That's it. Last thing, I, I talked to Harris a little bit to talk about the SEPTA organization. And uh, I can't say enough about the employees that we have. And uh, we're talking about giving back. We're, we're, uh, we're part of the network in Philadelphia. And we have uh, a number of things that we do as an organization to support that. And I can start with the cleanup that we have in, in uh, the mayor's cleanup that he has. We have over 800 people actually on the streets picking up trash basically around our stations or around our facilities uh, in the neighborhoods. Um, 800 people, we're probably the largest corporation that does that. Uh, we have uh, one of the largest uh, food drives benefiting Phil Abundance. And initially it started out with a combination of our riders and the employees, but more and more it's our employees that are actually doing the donating. And then we have the, uh, the toy drive, 
over 10,000 toys that we give back to the underprivileged within, uh, within this region. Um, so I'm really proud of what they do. Uh, some of the other things that, ha that happen if uh, you have uh, Hurricane Katrina, our people step forward. Um, I think there was a couple years ago the, uh, the Red Cross asked us, can you do a book drive? And I said, yeah, we can do a book drive. We d collected over 50,000 books. They haven't asked us again because I don't think they knew what to do with all those books. <laughs> um, 